Well, good morning, and we're a webinar on accelerating your use of Microsoft Excel with FME. My name is Dale Lutz, and I'm joined this morning by... Mark Stokes. And Iris Gutowski. And together we're going to walk you through a number of things that hopefully will leave you with um, better equipped to deal with Excel in your daily lives in a much more efficient and fun and useful and productive way. So to do that, we're going to introduce ourselves a bit more thoroughly and mostly do a number of demonstrations that hopefully align to the kinds of problems that you deal with in your daily work. So again, this is who we are and I won't uh, stress now you know what we look like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go and you can hash, look at there's you can invite people to tweet about this. That's I don't right, know that yeah. we ever have anybody ever tweet, but that's okay. And here's our uh, gallery of people standing by to help of which Mark, you look like you're obscured today. Yes, well, that's because I'm on the main page. Yes, but uh, Robin is standing by, as is Dan Eisminger, so please ask plenty of questions. Keep them going as we rush through things. And if we don't get back to you during the webinar, we definitely will immediately afterwards. So just a few words about SAFE. Uh, we're here in beautiful Surrey, British Columbia, where it's not raining today, so that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah. And uh, we do have a worldwide presence with partners all over and literally thousands of, as far as we know, quite happy customers. Yeah, and I still don't understand where the colors came in from that map. It kind of seems to be... Uh, it's a Voronoi diagram. Oh, it's a Voronoi diagram. Yes, we, we, uh, <laughs> you know, we spare no um, geospatial geek expense to uh, make our diagrams. So you can see, like, whoever is in Spain, I think, projects their influence all the way to South Africa, yeah, for example. Okay. That's, okay. How, that's how this map works. So that's us. What is this product called FME? You're going to see us demonstrating it today. It's a product we've been making for nearly 20 years now. But it transforms data from wherever it is to wherever you need it to be. As I like to say, FME puts data in its place so that you can use it more effectively and more efficiently. We work with a wide variety of different data formats, many of which are spatial, but today we're going to be focusing almost exclusively on non-spatial, where FME can definitely shine and add a lot of great value. Most recently, we've done a pile of work upgrading our non-spatial capabilities, and in particular, our ability to work with Excel. I like to say, for those of you that are spatial folks, that Excel is the shapefile of non-spatial data, which means that it's the, the place where everybody goes, for lack of a better idea, um, whenever they're moving or working with non-spatial. So we've been right, quite surprised how much and how often we see Excel being used. And you can see from the slide all the different things that FME can be used for in general, and we're going to be showing these types of things today as they apply to Excel in particular. So with that, I think we're going to jump over to our first poll, which I will start. And uh, just to get a sense from you uh, out there, how much have you been using FME? So you should have that poll. We go fairly briskly in our webinars. If you find the pace a bit too fast, if you're not familiar with FME, we do have um, a morning webinar. I think you're usually on that, aren't you, Mark? Yep, yep. Tomorrow, every uh, Thursday? Tomorrow, every Thursday, yeah. Yeah, That's we've right. got a slide later on that uh, uh, shows how to get, get onto that. Right, so those will be a little bit uh, more soft intro. And then as well, we do uh, fairly regularly uh, four hour or maybe two mornings of four hours each course for training yeah. which people can take for free we do not charge for that so we'll call that good and we'll look at uh, our audience and I can see that uh, we've got a fair bit of you that are relatively recent FMEers and uh, a plurality that are old timers so they won't uh, have any surprises as we work through things but there's 18 percent of you that aren't using FME and so we thank you so much for tuning in Hopefully today we can show you some of the value you might be able to get from using FME, particularly when you're dealing with Excel. So I think if I've done everything right, I'm now on this slide that has a woof on it. Is that right? That's right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what that, that might be a little bit of uh, foreshadowing and I'm apologizing in advance. If you're a pet lover, we're going to be very, very, uh, we're going to deliver a very deadpan delivery of our uh, first demonstration right. uh, related to the pets. But anyway, why would you use FME for Excel? There's a host of reasons. I personally think the bottom one, repeatability and automation. Yes, Excel is an amazing environment, and if you don't mind clicking, you can do just about anything you could ever imagine. But sometimes you get tired of clicking, especially if it's a repetitive kind of task. 
And hopefully today as you see us work with this, you'll see how by creating these workflows, you can get your Excel sheets the way you want them without you having to do hours of clicking and fiddling. Um, other reasons people use FME with Excel to deal with very large files, either Excel itself is having troubles with them or the source is coming from outside where the data is just so large you couldn't even put it into Excel without doing some kind of summary ahead of time. Spatial data is often tucked away in Excel and so you might want to put that on a map and you might want to do merging or deriving quantities. I actually spent my last two weeks helping my wife merge a CSV file with an Excel spreadsheet of registrations for like an, an unfortunately designed online registration system that she was working with where the output needed to be name badges to print. And so we merged these two data sets together along the way. We figured out what people had used different names on the different systems and sorted out all the data quality issues. And in the end, her event went off without a hitch. So FME to the rescue, never getting any glory. <laughs> As usual, the, uh, the geeks in the back room don't get any of the glory. The people in the front do, but nonetheless, nobody was without a name badge. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at a couple of things from the city of Vancouver's open data site. And uh, Mark found a tasteful picture there. I'm a little nervous about, uh, we're, we're kind of pushing the envelope here in terms of what we're trying to do today. But here's the Vancouver open data site. And there's a wide range of different kinds of data. There's some that's spatial and some that's not. And we thought we'd go for the first thing that was non-spatial that started with an alphabetic letter. So, and that happens to be the animal inventory of deceased animals. And so um, ahead of this, I downloaded that. And so you can see here in my critters uh, directory, we do have an Excel sheet of all the dead animals of Vancouver. So um, let me just... Going back to 2001. Yes. So, um, and it is quite a fascinating kind of file involving odd codes and descriptions and uh, things. I would argue that this is a poorly structured Excel sheet because we have some kind of codes here for cats and others, yet the dogs get their own column. And um, I don't know why they would have done that. Why, why, why would the squirrels be in with the cats? But I think um, that's fairly typical of Excel data in many cases. It's in, the way, in some ways, it's the CAD data of tabular data. That's true. People it's often unstructured. just throw in stuff. and. So uh, I thought what we'd try to do this morning, um, you know, Bill Murray in the great movie Ghostbusters referred to cats and dogs living together as being a bad thing. So let's go over here and uh, fire up FME. Now, I've switched to uh, Windows environment. For those that are hardcore Mac people, uh, your answer is coming soon. We do have FME on the Mac, but today we're delivering on Windows as well. So I'm dragging the dead animals out onto my FME. I'm going to go into the parameters and indicate I want to read them, but there's uh, field names on the first column. So let's just do that. And here's our um, schema down here. I think Mark will probably look at this later. A little preview of our data. If we wanted to see that there's squirrels, and I think squirrels spelt wrong too, mm -hmm. so that's a data problem. Um, anyway, we'll go ahead and put this out here. And what I intend to do, I want to separate the cats from the dogs. And uh, I think that's a good thing to do in general. Whether they're alive or dead, it's not good if they're together. So I'm going to go ahead, and what I want to do, FME is this thing where you start with your data on the left, and you do some things to it as it moves to the right until we get to our destination. And so. I want to do what's called a tester. Now, we have these things called transformers, and in here there's a gallery of a myriad of them. I can search it for things related to testing. Actually, I'm going to do a test filter. And so I can find this, and one of the tricks of FME is knowing which things you want to apply. That's why I recommend the intro course or the intro session. I'm going to just drag out the test filter, and now I'm going to start separating this data flow into cats, dogs, and others. So I'm going to say if, let's see, if the value of the dogs column is not blank, so if it's not blank, then that's a dog. So I'm going to put the dogs out there. Who let the dogs out? Here you're seeing today. Um, the cats, on the other hand, they're, they're rooming with squirrels others, and squirrels other and side. other things. So we need the cat and other. What we're going to say there, if it's equal to SDC, I'd love to know what the SD, single dead cat? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we're going to go with that. Now, I'm going to take a shortcut here because there's data in here that needs to be upper lower. There's upper lower case. Sometimes there's lowercase SDC. I could do something very simply to make this uppercase. I'm, 
I'm not going to do that right now, but there's other work we could roll up the sleeves and do a better job. And whoops, I need to make sure that that goes out with something called cats. And otherwise, I'm going to say this is the others. And um, I noticed that there was a Bengal cat in there. Oh, okay. I'm That's a bit that. unusual, yes. <laughs> but it is not considered a cat. Uh, so we'd have to do some work. You know, we could debate whether it should have been or not. When we're setting up FME, we often get to this stage and say, look, we've done a lot of work. Let's connect an inspector and just see where we are so far. We go ahead and run this. And up comes our inspector. And uh, let's just hop back. You can tell how many. We read about 7,000 dead animal records. And we formed them out. Looks like there's a whole lot more cats than dogs that pass away. Um, but a lot of others. And that this would be where you'd want to do more work. Because I have a feeling that there's dogs and cats hanging out in here too. Yeah, probably. Um, so we can look here. Here's the cats. And you can see the description of them. Now there's this useless column for the dogs in there. Here's the dogs. And... Um, there's something that's non-blank in the dog's column. That's what we're taking that. Um, so some interesting data there. And here, is, or here are the others that, um, again, squirrels and coons. Wouldn't you really say raccoon? Yeah. Um, probably. But anyway, squirrels, spelt wrong, guinea pigs, and all sorts of things in there. So that's pretty good. We can see that it's done a job separating it. Now what I'm going to do is make sure that I can output this into Excel. And I'm going to go and put it in my critters, I'm going to call this, this is my sorted output. And I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. And what I'm going to do is duplicate on the writer. I just right clicked and said duplicate to get an output type. And now this one will be for the dogs. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to clean it up a bit because I don't need anything to do with cats in here. And the amount for the others, those are two things that are obvious that aren't needed. And now I can duplicate this. And these are going to be different sheets in my output. So in this case, I'm dealing with now the cats. Whoops, I didn't call that one dogs. One of the most important things. I can rename that like this. Whoops. Rename to dogs. I've got dogs. I've got cats. I can put that data flow over there. And I really, in this case, need to rename this column to be the cats situation. And this is the amount for the cats. By doing that, I get this to show up red. I need to then bring my designations over that aren't being written. So there's the amount and the amount for the others, which in this case is the cats. And lastly, I would duplicate this for my others. So I'm going to rename that to be others. And I think if I drag the others down here, I have done that. And then I need to, uh, again, name that column that's called others. Or cats to others. Let that go and map those up. So let's see, that's the amount for the others. Here we go. And the cat designation goes in there. All right, so I think if I've done this correctly, I've now, I'm going to have it pop up and show me what I'm doing, but it's also going to be writing to a spreadsheet with any luck at all. We've looked at this prior. Let's whip over, take a look if we've got some sorted output. And we do. So we've got the others separated out. We've got the cats. And they don't have any extra columns. One could argue that this column is not very useful, but I left it anyway. And here we have the dogs, where there are some bits of information in that column. We could start doing other work to decode these things further. So there's our cats and dogs no longer living together. Um, now, that was sort of whimsical and hopefully not offensive to you, but I thought I'd show a more useful one. Hopefully you got the sense of what FME is about there. But let's take a look at another one, which is the business licenses in Vancouver. And on this one, um, let's go first and take a look at the data. I had downloaded this the other night, so let's take a look at the licenses. Here's the business licenses that come from that same site. One of the things I notice is that they have a status in them that's inactive or issued or pending. And um, there's also a thing over here about the fee paid. And I do see a lot that are blank that are in the fee paid. But one wonders if things were issued and the fee paid was blank, that might be interesting. So I've done a few things here. So I've brought in the businesses as before. Um, I've created an output sheet, but I've said that I'm going to fan out by the status attribute. What that means is I'm going to get a different tab for every or different sheet in my worksheet for every value of status. I'm also going into the statistics calculator 
and I'm saying, let's do some analysis on the fee paid. I'm interested in what those are, and I'm going to put them out into another sheet. And lastly, I'm doing another tester here where I'm checking who has been issued, but they have no fee. And those guys I'm going to put out here after sorting them by the date they were issued. These are the kind of things, a very small workflow. I'm going to go and run this. One other thing I'm pointing out is that this one is actually getting its data live from the Vancouver Open Data website. We can point at a spreadsheet that's sitting out there on the net and have it downloaded. It doesn't have to be local. And so this is the most fresh version. So I could set this up to run every night knowing that I'm always getting the most recent version of this. And I think that's the interesting part of this is that yes. this is uh, building a repeatable and automated workflow that Dale's put together. So it seems like a lot of detailed work to set this up, but then he can run this as often as he needs. Every time they update the business licenses, he can get a new delivery without having to fiddle with the spreadsheet again. Yes. So we're all done now. I'll just point out related to that, whenever we run FME, it shows us at the top the command line that we could use, we could write this into a batch script. Later on, Iris and Mark will show this running in a server situation. I think. Yeah. Uh, yep. You're going to be that brave. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> so um, we've done our business license sorting. It's now, now, that was the original data. Let's take a look if we've got any output here. And we do. And um, here's the summary. Here we go. So let me just bring that up a wee bit. And we can see that we have sheets here for the inactive licenses the pending ones, as well as the issued ones. So that's been nicely separated quickly, as well as producing a nice little summary here um, of, of what's going on with each of them. So that's the first um, thing that I output. And again, showing that FME can output many things at once, we outputted another spreadsheet, a totally separate one. And these are all the folks that somehow have been issued a license but never paid any fee. And um, we find that very interesting. And I actually noticed a friend of mine was actually in this list. We won't find him right now. So I do need to phone him up and say, it's actually the guy who framed my house. And say, how did you get in here, Peter and Luan? Uh, if you're listening in, you may want to pay your fee before somebody Because Vancouver you. needs the money. Yes, it certainly <laughs> does. So again, the data quality things, when I was, you know, I, this is a kind of a made up example, but when I was doing that work for my wife, piles of data quality things able to be wrung out very quickly. Who changed their email address? Who um, used a different first and last name uh, when different systems are merged? These kinds of things are very easy to pick out. And so with that, Mark, I think I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, take it from here if I can figure this out. So let's see. You are Mark Stokes, are you? I am. I I'm going to make you the presenter. There you go, Mark. All right. So hopefully that was uh, enlightening, and now Mark will take us the rest of the and way. Mark and Iris. Hi. And yes. Dale. <laughs> well, I'm mostly going to shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. So the motivation for us for um, replacing the Excel reader, we did that uh, this year. We had uh, an older API based on the Microsoft uh, ADO interface, and uh, we found, a, a we think, a, a better in, um, and improved uh, API to give us more flexibility on the reading and writing of uh, Excel spreadsheets. So uh, what this uh, new uh, reader and writer gives us on the reading side, the ability to read multiple uh, sheets, um, and importantly in there, the ability to read named ranges within sheets that you might have. So you can read subsets of the data, so that's pretty powerful. Reading formulas, so there's an option there, you can see on the bottom of the parameters form shown there, an option to uh, read formulas. And, um, and then we can do some uh, schema adjustment as we read the data in. So that's what this attribute panel is for. We're going to look at that in, in terms of um, how you can do that. And that's mostly related around the idea of creating a geometry. So if you have a data set that's got a couple of fields that represent uh, northings, eastings, or latitudes and longitudes, uh, you can convert those into a geometry and start to spatialize your data right off the top. And then on the uh, writer side, um, again, more flexibility. When we deprecated the old ADO uh, Excel writer and replaced it with the new one, 
and again, we can write into multiple sheets. Uh, Dale was uh, illustrating that. We can write into named ranges within a sheet uh, so that you can position your data quite nicely. There are some formatting tools, so you can uh, format the text uh, and the uh, and put colors on the text and cells, so some uh, things to play around with there. But I think uh, one of the more interesting things that we can do is the ability to use a template. So if you have a spreadsheet that has a nice layout and uh, got title um, uh, pages or uh, sheets and um, and those kind of things, what we can do is we can use that as a template and then load the new data and update the template. Uh, in there, and then you still have that uh, nice looking spreadsheet. And if there's any charts in there, we're going to have a quick look at one of those. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we can uh, build a new chart with the new data. So uh, those are kind of some of the new things that uh, readers and writers uh, are, are giving us. One thing, Mark, that some of the folks out there are asking is what FME did the new ones appear in? Some of the longtime FMEers. This is SP3, I believe. Uh, SP2, I think. SP2. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if you're on SP1 or older, you have the old one, which you definitely don't want to keep using. Yeah, yeah. It's the old one is still there, yeah. and so if you have built uh, workflows and workspaces with the uh, uh, the original Excel Read and Writer, that will still carry on, um, and then you have the choice of replacing that in your existing workflows, or as you move forward, uh, we recommend that you uh, experiment um, with the uh, with the new one. So uh, going back to um, an example here, I've got uh, a bird and egg survey so these, data. These are live birds. No birds these. are dead. <laughs> In fact, it's the beginning of life when eggs are around. So Mark's going to the other end of That's the, right, yeah. the circle of life. We're covering yeah. the whole the whole thing here today. So we get, uh, this is a data set that uh, we've been using for quite a while. Um, uh, so let's uh, maybe just uh, have a look at that, what we've got there. So it's a, a bunch of data, survey data that we've got in a spreadsheet. Uh, got the uh, eggs um, surveys in there, and then the nest locations. And so this is a sheet here where we've got some named ranges. We've got two tables in here, which seems to be fairly uh, common in the idea of um, putting together reports, I think, in Excel, where the kind of multiple tables are put in the same sheet. So but very yeah. mean-spirited for all the data jockeys. That's right. But so, we're not afraid anymore. But we're not afraid of this. <laughs> <laughs> so we can uh, get uh, that whoops, um, uh, spreadsheet. I'm going to drag it onto my uh, workspace here and start to build up uh, a workflow. So in the parameters, there's quite a bit of complexity here now. So we've got the two main sheets that uh, we've got on that spreadsheet, the egg survey, and the nest locations. And I don't want to read those. What I want to do is I want to read the actual uh, named ranges that are associated with those uh, different data sets. So I, the only thing I have to do here is to tell it where, which row my column headings are going to appear on. And uh, so that's uh, that one there, row four on that one. And you're picking it off from the preview, I guess. And I'm picking it off from the preview here. The preview is kind of hopping me around. and. It's giving me that named range, and it's the first row in that named range, which is row five in the actual uh, spreadsheet. OK, and so then we can play around with some of the data. So we've got nest no locations here. Uh, so that's the nest data. And that does have a latitude and longitude associated with it. So what we can do is now look at that and convert that into a geometry. And uh, that should be all we need to do. We do need to say what uh, coordinate system that geometry is going to be in. So I'm, it's lat long, so I'm going to make a guess that it's uh, LL84 and uh, go from there. And then again, just to check uh, what that data looks like, we can, I don't want to put a logger in there, uh, we can put in some inspectors just to have a look at that data and make sure that uh, we're reading it correctly. And because we've uh, added a spatial context to that data, now we can see within our um, uh, viewer, we can see the different points there that uh, for the nest locations. Um, and then we've got the table of uh, uh, the egg data. And uh, we've uh, also got the species lookup that comes from uh, the what bird uh, 
website. So these are coming from a website it's, uh, called What Bird, so you can check it out. Now we ha we can uh, move uh, formula data around at the moment. We can't move hyperlinks, um, and so that would be really nice. So there are on my original data there are hyperlinks on these uh, What Bird IDs. So uh, obviously this is still a work in progress as we add new readers and writers we find out um, that people want specific uh, things and so being able to read hyperlinks is uh, on the to-do list there. Okay, well I don't want to build uh, go through building the whole um, workflow from scratch there so I'm just going to drag on the uh, workflow that uh, we created and so this is an example of just taking some um, spreadsheet tables and then doing other interesting things with them. And uh, one of them is spatializing that data. So we're doing that. I'm reprojecting it, in this case, into uh, Texas um, Central, State Plain Central. But what I've got here is a tool, the Inline Querier tool. And this is a, a kind of an internal database to FME that allows us to do SQL queries on non-SQL data sets. So uh, the Excel spreadsheet uh, reader doesn't support SQL, but what we can do is read those tables and then build up some SQL. So if you're um, a real SQL fan and you've got some spreadsheet data, you can do some simple joins here, in this case just joining the um, egg uh, and uh, nest data to the species lookup. And we can also do some uh, pretty interesting things uh, that uh, Iris and one of our other colleagues helped us put together, which is kind of a pivot table, really, uh, and joining the, and summarizing all the species and uh, nest uh, kind of data. So this would be useful if you're someone who dreams in SQL or SQL, then you can apply that to your that's, Excel sheets that's right. and yeah. get whatever you want. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. So we could... Uh, see how that uh, looks as the result come out um, and uh, we can just open the containing folder there and have a look at the results and so there's uh, the tables that we've produced the species summaries so I've done a little bit of formatting on the colors there just to illustrate that we can uh, change the uh, colors there and I think on the nest that a robin egg blue? Yes. That's a robin <laughs> egg blue, yeah <laughs> and uh, so on the number of values you can put in if thens uh, else is um, in there to color the values. And so that's done when you build the output. Uh, Dale was building those um, output uh, tables or the feature types uh, earlier on. And uh, so where was that? The nest summary, I think. When we look at the user attributes, uh, what was that? The number of eggs? Uh, we've got a little formula here, these custom format strings. Now these are very awkward little strings, but they are we are using the same syntax and formulas that Excel uses. So if you're an Excel user, you'll understand these. And there's a whole, um, in our help, uh, in the FME uh, Excel Read and Writer help, there's a link to the Microsoft website, which describes how these uh, custom formulas are built up so that you can do interesting things with um, uh, setting up the colors on your spreadsheet data. So uh, that's uh, kind of the results there on, um, on the birds and nests, I think. Oh, we've got ah. a poll. So how do we uh, I run? Can, I can you, run you're going to trigger here. that. So Mark showed some spatial stuff. We're very curious in our user base, how many of you are dealing with spreadsheets that have some kind of a spatial aspect to them? So uh, let's... Uh, have you give your answer and uh, early on the spatial had a solid lead but it's eroding as time goes on <laughs> <laughs> so um, but we'll just go a little bit longer last few people coming in and we will close the poll there we go let's close it and we'll share the results so there you go and um, you can see that uh, only 6% of you say you don't. Oh, oh wow, that's wow. interesting. That's a, considering that 18% of you don't use FME, uh, the FME crowd is a bit of a more of a spatial crowd, but I was thinking that about 18% anyway would have uh, said that they, um, that they didn't. So, uh, and uh, about half or most is 61%. So there's a lot of spatial data. Yeah. And so that trick that Mark just showed, pulling down to say that something is the X and the Y, is going to be handy. Some folks ask, how do you define the coordinate system? 
there is a place on the form to say the, where the coordinate system is. And others asked if we could read an MVR, a, a rectangle. But to do that, you have to use a couple transformers yes. afterwards yeah. to make yeah. the rectangle. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's great. Thanks so much. It's a very spatial crowd we have today. Yeah. Oh, and what better? So yeah, and so what could uh, John Snow in his uh, in the 1600s or whatever it was, um, 1800s, um, have done with a spreadsheet and uh, XML to uh, reduce the amount of cholera <laughs> plaguing London in those days? So yeah, so we've had a look at uh, converting fields into X into geometries. And then once you've done that, then you can blend that with other data uh, that FME can read in a more traditional kind of FME role reading uh, spatial context and, um, and put together some spatial data and do that kind of analysis. So let's uh, have another look, uh, and look at another uh, example here. I'm not going to build the workspace from scratch because uh, that uh, will take a bit too much time. But uh, what I've got is I've got a City of Vancouver geodatabase. Uh, I've got some cell signal measurements uh, that have been uh, done around the city there. And I'm going to try and blend those together. So what I want to do is I'm going to read that uh, signal data. Uh, we can uh, have a quick look at that uh, spreadsheet uh, there. That's a fairly big one. Um, and it's got some latitudes and longitudes that we are going to convert into uh, some geometries, uh, point data, and then uh, I've got uh, a geodatabase that has some neighborhood um, areas in it, and uh, they're in a different projection, so I'm reprojecting that data. And then what I'm doing is doing a point on area overlayer here, combining the data, the points and areas, and uh, for the points, I'm attaching the neighborhood name to where that measurement uh, was made, and there's some population data on there as well. And for the areas, just sort of for um, visual purposes, we're creating a KML file that we can have a look at those and uh, have a look at some of the count statistics of how many measurements were done in an area. So this is kind of a more traditional role for FME in reading different data sets and combining them in interesting ways and getting different re results, one being an Excel spreadsheet and the other being a, a KML file. Okay, so that all seems to be happy. So let's just have a look at that uh, KML file that we put out. Um, I'm not going to inspect it. I want to just go to the containing folder and might as well have a look at that in Google Earth because uh, that's what uh, it's there for. So lots of tools in FME. Actually, we had a great webinar a few uh, weeks ago on uh, using FME in KML and so on. And uh, so that's uh, beautiful Vancouver. These are the different neighborhoods, and uh, we've carried across uh, the data. And then there's that num measurements, which are the number of measurements uh, that were made in each of those areas. Uh, so by combining that data in a spatial uh, way. OK. And then let's have another look at uh, something else. So. One of the things that people do a lot of in Excel are su is summarizing um, data in uh, interesting ways. We've seen that twice now. Uh, Dale was uh, doing some statistics on his data. We were doing using the inline query to uh, build some pivots uh, in um, uh, on the uh, other data there. And uh, so now we can look at some traditional demographic uh, data that one of uh, our users uh, was working with and uh, uh, do a pivot on that. So they're trying to bring in from different zones, I guess these are different regions for the census uh, data, uh, the number of counts of people found in a particular place and uh, their uh, age and uh, gender. And so what they wanted to do is to build a pivot based on that, uh, based for, for each age range and their gender. They wanted to summarize the number of people uh, in that, um, uh, in those, uh, for each uh, region. So let's uh, close that down. And I think... Uh, Iris is going to go into a little bit more detail on the workings of the uh, attribute pivoter. Yep, that's coming up. <laughs> yeah, 
good text out. So just to zoom in there, so we've got, uh, we're reading just some very plain uh, census data report. Uh, I'm putting that through uh, the attribute pivoter that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on to summarize the data. We've got quite a few tools uh, for doing that in FME. Uh, and then I'm going to build up the uh, summary report uh, and the, uh, the pivot uh, summary as well. Now what's interesting here is that I'm using a template file to uh, build that um, uh, spreadsheet. And that template file uh, is because the names in this uh, data set are a little bit more complex than basically the, the way they want to structure that data is to have the names uh, on two lines in the data set. So we've got uh, the age range and then on a different line the male female. So that's this is your template here? This is my template. So you're going to use it as a starting point, mm -hmm. and we're going to add into it. And I'm going to throw the data in, and the data will be thrown in underneath there. So we've got both the report data, which is basically the original data, that, yeah. and then I'm going to add to that report uh, the pivot uh, report that uh, we've got there. So we can try and run that. The symphony unfolds. That That's log right. File. Yeah, the old uh, beautiful log file. We should. Uh, put uh, colors in there to keep us uh, happy. And then uh, let's um, oh. go into the containing folder there. And so this is the results of that uh, data set. So there you can see what we did is we kept that um, original template with those titles and then just populated the data. And it's been summarized by zone and the counts made for each of the combinations of age range and uh, gender there, and some totals thrown in uh, over on the right-hand side here. And again, this is a repeatable task. I think that's the main point here is that, so, you know, I think even in Excel, it would take a little while to build this up. Excel's got some actually really good uh, pivot table tools. Yes. But as your data sets grow in, grow in size, that might become cumbersome. Um, but also within FME, what we can do is build a nice repeatable workflow. So uh, when next year's census data comes through, uh, hopefully that user will just be able to rerun this workspace with the new data and uh, get the results they need. Okay. Okay, over to you, Iris. Okay, so um, I think Mark gave me a good lead in here. I want to talk in a little bit more about uh, larger data sets that uh, can be slow to process and manipulate within Excel. Uh, I suspect this is something probably a fair number of you have run into are, are data sets that you can open with Excel but they take quite a while and it's hard to use a lot of the tools and functionalities within Excel like the pivot, the pivoting. So uh, FME is able to to handle and manipulate that data much more efficiently and we were able to replicate a lot of those Excel workflows you have so you can set them up to automate them. And the kind of things that you can do, like uh, Mark, Mark touched on, were pivots and statistics. That's what I'll be focusing on in my demo coming up. And uh, you can also, like Dale showed earlier, split up a large data set uh, into subsets and send them off to different files. And you can also do a lot of cleanup uh, with FME, as we've, we've seen in a lot of these examples, to, uh, to really get your data the way you want it and do it a lot faster than you could within Excel. So I'm going to just go into my demo here. Right, just opening up this uh, workspace here. So uh, I'm just going to... Oh, you're already editing it. I'm already editing it, so <laughs> hopefully that won't cause any issues for us. <laughs> I don't think I've edited it. Made too many changes. Why don't you zoom to 100%? Please. All right, let's zoom in. So uh, here we've got, uh, this is actually, I think, the same file that Mark showed in an early example. It's a uh, signal data, and we see it's got, it's got some spatial components, but we're going to be focusing on non-spatial manipulation in this example. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is do a little bit of cleanup here. It's got a date column in it, and it's not exactly the way that we want it. So uh, FME has a transformer called the date formatter, which can take a, uh, a date string 
uh, a date and actually it, it tries to interpret it itself and will put it in the out desired output format you want. So here actually FME will just guess at, at, at the format of the string and uh, we can get it out to the year, month, day format which is what we want in our output file. So we'll do that. Uh, the next thing we want to do is that this file actually has a code. It's an alphanumeric code and it's got I believe three letters at the beginning and then a number at the end. And uh, this is all in, in one attribute, and we'd rather split it into two so that we can uh, later sort on the first part of the code and then uh, also extract that, that unique numeric part of the code for later on. So uh, we have a transformer. We have many string manipulation transformers. Here we're using the attribute splitter, uh, which takes that code. Uh, it takes the string here that I, I believe Mark set up that will split it into that that for first three letters and the number at the end, and it'll output it in a list attribute. Uh, and these lists in FME, we can also later rename and take each part of the list and assign it to a brand new attribute. So this would be a new column in our file. So we're splitting up that one that one code into two new two new columns. And uh, now I think the main thing we want to do is show the pivoting. I think we've showed an example before of subsetting in the beginning. Uh, this is certainly something you might want to do. Uh, here we're showing you could subset this file based on the prefix in that code there. It's really just separating the cats yeah. and the dogs. Yeah, again, another example. It's just uh, <laughs> a, a little more... Uh, the sheep from the goats. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So uh, we're uh, here now I'll get, I'll get into more detail on the attribute pivoter. And so what, what this is is essentially just like uh, the pivot table tool in Excel. It allows you to kind of restructure your data, do some statistics, and uh, the pivot comes in because we're actually taking the row values and creating new columns. So we're essentially pivoting the data there. Um, so the parameters here, just to explain them briefly, uh, we allow you to group, uh, group by a unique combination of, of the row attributes. So uh, this parameter here will determine uh, what rows you get out. So you'll get one feature or one row for every unique combination of values of these attributes. So here we've only selected one, so every unique value here will come out as its own attribute, as its own feature, sorry. Uh, you could select any number and you can also order them to create a kind of hierarchy if you have a more complex scenario. Which is our, in this case, it's our reformatted date, I think. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, in this case we're, so we're going to group by date. So we want a, uh, new, a new row for every unique date, and we've, we're going to have some duplicate dates in here. Um, and the other thing, this, this is the group columns by attribute. This is where the pivoting is actually happening. So this, this attribute that we select here, its unique values will actually become new columns, mm -hmm. which is, is interesting for FME because uh, this is actually changing our schema a bit. So um, this is really a, a new tech, a new thing that we're introducing into the product. and. Uh, but lastly here, we're, we're going to pick uh, what attribute we want to perform statistics on. So since we'll be grouping by both the, uh, the date and this other, this other code ID, uh, we're actually going to perform statistics on our power attribute. And uh, we can select numerous types of statistics here. Here we're just taking an average, but you could select uh, multiple different statistics uh, and perform these. And you'd get actually... Uh, you get a new column for each of those statistics, so you would get um, you'd get more columns that way. And lastly, you can just uh, specify a name for. We're going to create a summary row, and you can just specify a prefix for that. And that's what that uh, that parameter is for there. So that's that's the pivoter. Uh, so we're going to send that out. Uh, one thing that is interesting, as I touched on earlier, this pivoter is actually going to be changing the schema of the data because we're going to create new columns. Uh, based on the values, and uh, these aren't going to be known to FME before runtime, so since it will actually depend on the unique values in your file. So we, we like to think of this as a dynamic schema scenario. So you do have to, um, we have to essentially tell our writer to be prepared for this, tell our writer to expect the unexpected here. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we, do, we need to do when we're using this transformer is to check the dynamic properties mm -hmm. mode on the writer feature type, and essentially this is telling the writer you're going to get some new columns. You don't know what they are. You have to you have to be on the lookout for that. So uh, that's an important thing to check off. And also and also to note, uh, if you send the uh, pivoter output directly to the inspector, you may not see what you expect because a lot of that interpreting of the columns is happening at the writer stage. So you want to wait until your translation is run 
uh, before you inspect it to see what the writer will actually look the writer output will actually look like and uh, uh, lastly, uh, this is another template. This is another uh, illustration of a template scenario. So I believe uh, we've added in an example of how you can modify a uh, cover page uh, on your template. Here we're just adding in uh, a timestamp. A timestamp. We're using the timestamp for transformer to get the time that I'm running this workspace, and where I'm just adding in my name as an attribute, and we're writing that to a named range in my template which I can just quickly show you the template. Uh, by creating named ranges in your yeah. template makes it very easy to stuff yes. values in. Yes, so that's it's a really neat uh, trick there that I can use to get a uh, nicely formatted file here. So we see we've got a title page, and Ooh. I just I want to replace Mark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't want him credit. getting credit for it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my name in there and add a timestamp. And, uh, and we see here a little preview. We've got a chart set up to, uh, to plot the results of our pivot. So we're going to do it? We're going to do it. I'll you want to you throw in um, an inspector there just to show oh, that sure. um, schema okay, stuff? Okay, well. we can do that. So I'll just add that right up. This would be editor. for long time FMEers. You'd be curious how we're pulling yes. this magic off. Because normally in FME, you need to know the schema before you start. And here we're doing it on the fly. So that's kind of a new thing that we're going to be expanding the power of moving forward. And again, the symphony unfolds yes. as we watch. Ooh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Let's see. What we have my file open. Let's see. Uh... It's, yeah, uh... you got the file open. Okay, so right that's here. another thing to be careful with, Excel. Uh... Just close them all. Well, but what if it's on her other computer? I think we just choose a different output file name. Because okay. she might have it open yeah, on yeah. her other oh, machine. Okay, that's a good point. Um, so up there on your. Just one. There we go, version two. Okay. And now we anxiously watch. <laughs> Whoop. All right, we don't need to open up. All right. There we go. We'll watch the symphony unfold again as we nervously await a successful outcome. As it grinds through. Oh! Okay. Okay. Well, well, let's just open up the. All right, so we'll with what's, uh, what we've done. try to figure that out. Yeah. All right, so sorry, you had, the oh, so you had it open already. Okay. So oh, results. results here. In theory, this is what should have happened. All right, in theory, <laughs> we should have populated, <laughs> populated our pivot table here and uh, and oh, well, I see. you're oh, still yeah, in there, so that, that's probably the problem. It yeah. won't work unless it's Mark Stokes. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> it's probably detects that. So yeah, so that that's the the important thing there is that we've got an empty template there, um, and uh, we loaded the new data into the power by date, uh, which was the summary data, and then because the chart had been set up in that template, you're going to get that chart with, uh, and then. At, with the next the days of work or surveys, you'd add a, another column onto that data, and the chart would expand uh, along with that. Yep. Okay, so I think uh, we'll move in. I, I believe we have a poll coming up. Do we? Actually, uh, yes, we do. We do so so uh, let me run the polls while Iris gets ready for her final demo, I think. Do you have one final one? Oh, uh, yep. Yeah. Well, okay, so <laughs> we do. I think I'll, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> See if she's that's feeling lucky. Like, that's the problem of so, shifting machines. That's uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. So um, I thought we'd ask after you've seen all the things here, you can choose more than one. Uh, you've seen the different variety of things that we've shown today. What kind of workflows would you find yourselves interested in automating? So uh, yeah, and if any of you choose the other option, please chat it so we might learn from that. While you're uh, going, I'll just mention a couple of questions people had. People asked if we can do geocoding. In other words, if the spreadsheet contains an address, can we put that on the map? We can't ourselves, but we include transformers that connect to a variety of services that do geocoding, the most uh, prominent of which would be ArcGIS Online. It has a fantastic geocoder. If you have an ArcGIS Online account, you, you do if you have ArcGIS, yep. then you can do geocoding that way. Um, the other ones, uh, there's folks called Proxix and in Canada DMTI, there's a few other options there. So I think with 70% uh, of the results in, I will close the poll and share those results. So people are really, they like all of the things is what it boils down to. Um, validating, summarizing, 
transforming, importing, creating spreadsheets, all that sort of stuff, really all these workflows are of interest to a very broad audience. Yeah. So um, that uh, kind of confirms our idea that, that Excel is a widely used for a wide range of things. So Iris, are you feeling lucky and okay. ready to go for Ho your last demo? Hopefully this goes a little <laughs> bit smoother here. So uh, just since a lot of you were interested in automating, I uh, want to just briefly uh, talk about FME Server and FME Cloud. And uh, these are our enterprise level solutions for distributing data. So they allow you to publish up your workspaces and share them uh, through the web interface with your colleagues or potentially anyone. And, uh, and they also allow you to schedule and automate workflows. So if you have, say, a spreadsheet that uh, gets updated and, and dumped on your system at a certain time, you can schedule your workspace to run uh, at regular intervals to update, to update things. So uh, I believe we're going to just show we can publish something like this workspace that I have. There's just a quick button. Uh, from Workbench to put to put this workspace up on the server here. So I'm just going to show you the interface. I don't know if I'll risk yeah, actually I, publishing it. Well, <laughs> you can publish it, but... Um, uh, we'll, re we'll rename just in case yeah. for... No uh, point in publishing one that we know doesn't work. Yes, no, no, we don't want to do that, so... Okay, so we'll just give this a new name. And uh, let's see here, we can just publish it. And we have a... Various different services here. The job submitter service is, is just a service where you have your workspace, you've got your files up on your server, you just schedule it to run, uh, and it'll just run on your server and output the data on your server as well. Uh, we've got various other different options, including data streaming, which will actually um, return your results to you right in the browser, and that's what I'm going to try to show right now. Uh, that's that's going to be exciting. Yep, yep. And uh, we've, we've got various other types of uh, services as well, different ways of getting your data out there. Um, so here is one that we've published earlier that was working earlier, so <laughs> hopefully, hopefully everything will be good. So we've got a data streaming service. It was the uh, workspace I showed you. So I can just run that here. And configure, I guess, would let you change yes. any parameters. Oh, I should have showed that probably here. I ah, can just that's where she's my... putting her name in. There, there we go. That's where I would have set that up. And we see I've got an Excel file here. And coming down. It's coming through. And I'll just try to open. Okay, and great. So that's... Uh, is in a different format. Yeah, okay. you just go yes. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. And there so, we can see. It's hey. now, now it's now we've we've correctly updated here, and uh, and we can see the number of dates. Yeah. Uh, so that was a slightly reduced data set. Uh, yes. So they yes. run quicker. Yes. So this shows in this case, Iris triggered the thing by visiting a web form, but yes. it could have been run uh, every morning at four a.m. Yes. We can also do things that if a file arrives in a directory. Um, then it happens, there's a new dead dog somewhere, and we'll run the translation again. All these things can happen hands-free. Yes, and uh, also just to let you know, uh, in, uh, to keep your eyes open for FME Cloud, we are introducing a complete platform as a service solution where uh, we'll take care of all the worries of maintaining your server. It'll be just set up on an Amazon web service. And uh, In fact, that's what you were running right there, wasn't it? Was that an FME cloud? No, or right. I don't think that, that was, that that was an FME cloud. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought it was FME cloud. Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. All right. So are we, uh, I think we're closing in on the end here. And we'll just uh, wrap up. So again, if you were new, I know we went through a lot of things at a fairly brisk pace today. But if you're new to FME, don't be afraid to visit Mark and Craig tomorrow morning. What yep. time? Uh, 10, 10 o'clock Pacific. Pacific. So you can sleep in. That's uh, right. Almost anywhere in North America, you can sleep in. If you're in Australia, you're getting up pretty early. Yeah. So apologies for that. But come uh, see them. You can find details at those places. It's weekly intro, probably the best to get a bit more. In terms of upcoming things, we'll be back here again in a few weeks to talk about Raster. About as far away as you can get from uh, Excel, I'd say. That's right. <laughs> Although we have seen people do raster in Excel. Yeah. I'm not joking. We've seen people do mapping. It's sort of like the old battleship, B7. Um, <laughs> you put a little symbol in there. It's been done. Uh, and it uh, doesn't mean we're proud of it, but it has been done. And people have used FME to turn a raster in Excel into a real raster. Yeah. And maybe I should do that. Yeah. If, you, if you will come back, if any of you come back, I will do that for you. Will it be a checkerboard? A checkerboard would even be better. Uh, that would be wonderful. Coming up, we're going to uh, come on the road uh, 
again in 2014. We already know we're going to be doing that uh, in North America in about the second week of April. So watch for that coming to, I think it's 15 or 17 cities in North America. But we're going to wind it all up with a huge gathering celebrating the 20th anniversary of uh, sorting out cats from dogs uh, here in Vancouver on, in June. June the 10th will be the first day of the conference. It'll actually go all week with training and things at the end. Uh, the main two days will be the Tuesday and the Wednesday. Uh, people from around the world telling their stories of what they're doing with FME, so we're pretty excited about that. So watch for that. You're the first ones to know that, incidentally. This That's is, right. We, we've this never is, announced. Uh, it just got finalized yesterday. Yeah. So. Uh, and this webinar is recorded, and all the examples will be put up on the website, and all the other webinars that we've done are recorded and up there as well. Including a working version yeah, of we'll, the Yeah, we'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> there, so you'll be able yes. to try that. Um, in terms of training, if you like, actually there was a couple people asking detailed KML questions in the uh, Q&A, so we've got a, a solution for you. It's free. Tune in to the September 18th. We give That's you today. Is it today? <laughs> wow. Is it happening right now? It's happening right oh, now. Oh, wow. So you're going to have to switch right now. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, There's still time because I only started at 8.30. <laughs> You can jump over. If you want to join seriously, uh, write us in here and we'll get you set up. Uh, the intro, come on, the intro can't be too much better than what we've just done, so you can do that. Or you can go for the two-dayer on the 24th and 25th that's just about FME in general. Yeah, but if you are interested in KML and you can't get on that um, training class, we did do a really nice webinar on KML yes. a few weeks ago, and that's recorded and all the examples are there, so you'll be able to pick up a lot from that. Right. So here's a bunch of other places you can get resources. <clears throat> uh, our blog has recently been updated, and there's a lot more action there than there used to be. And so I think that that's about it, other than uh, any interesting Q, Qs and As. Yeah. So, well, you've been answering them as we go, I think, today. I've been kind of looking along. One, um, somebody asked when, when Iris was doing the attribute split, she had hard-coded a 3 and a 9. Yeah, to, to know that it was it was an old Fortran style uh, code. Yeah. Other person people asked if it's a separator like a comma or a, <clears throat> or a pipe or something. Can we split by that? Absolutely. Yeah, or a tab. A lot of database dumps come out uh, as tab delimited. Yeah. Um, some people asked, are we good with XLS as well as XLS X? And the answer is yes. We can do any of that. And better still with XML, but Dawn isn't here. Yes. Well, that, what we say is that Excel is really taking the M out of XML. That's right. And so uh, Dawn doesn't know if he likes that. Can we set the order of the Excel tabs? Many people have asked that. Um, the easiest way would be to use a template yeah. that has them. Yeah. If you can't do that, then you have to get into controlling the order that the features arrive to the um, right-hand side of your workflow, which judicious use of feature holders and sorters can accomplish if you are sufficiently motivated. So one trick is, if you know you want the cats coming before the dogs, give all the cats a value of zero, the dogs a value of one, pop them into a sorter, sort by cat dog order, and then output them in. So basically the first one in is the first tab. It's a bit unfortunate, but um, it can be done. Um, open office, we don't do open office, I'm sorry about that. We have somebody that says go Iris, so you have a yes. fan out there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Can you create a spatial visualization from the coordinate data? And of course, you can by then outputting it onto a map. Yeah, um, we did that with the KML, but with yes. the areas. But we could have equally have used overlaid on those areas all the points uh, on the KML as well. So yeah, we could. Do so we could do that. I think they're also asking. We could also use a rasterizer within FME. We can make a raster, mm -hmm. and then you could output that to some other place yep. um, if if you wanted to. Um, let's see. More fans of Iris. You've got a lot of fans out wow. there. I don't know how and uh, let's see. Um, I think that probably. Let's see. Oh, this person asks if he if he's an an SQL person. You know, some workflows we've gone into, people are using Excel unnecessarily as an intermediary between their database <laughs> and where they really want to be, because there might be old workflows where you dumped CSV or Excel from a database. And now you've got to mop that up. If that's your situation, you can just use SQL directly in FME against the original database. Yeah, definitely. If you can get the database to do the work, do that. If you can avoid dumping the database data out to CSV or Excel as an intermediate step, 
we would suggest going back to the databases. Some bigger organizations don't like that. The DBAs like to control the queries. They don't like people doing ad hoc queries, so sometimes you're locked out from that. But if you do have access to the database, get the database to do the work and the joins. Right, and we can do that in FME. There's a transformer called the SQL Creator or yeah. the SQL Executor. Those are your friends for being fast and easy to do that. As well as all our database readers have the ability to throw SQL back as you're reading tables as well. So, so I think we'll wrap it up there. It's, it's uh, right on the hour. Again, we'll be providing you links to the, the recordings and the raw materials later. And if uh, we weren't able to answer <clears throat> one of your questions, somebody will follow up with, a, with an email. And Brad, you're asking for KML. We'll get back to you as soon as this is over to get you into the class if you really want to um, right away. And um, I guess the only other line that I was trying to work in is that, you know, I said I was using FME on the weekend and prior to help my wife with her thing. You might say that at Safe Software we eat our own dog food uh, here. <laughs> so on that um, uplifting note, thanks so much for tuning in and happy fme -ing. And uh, goodbye from beautiful Surrey, British Columbia. That's right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.